So, ladies and gentlemen, I've got my tie on, I've got my jacket, and I've got a piece of paper. So I think we all know what time it is. It's time to predict this season's Premier League table. Even with a couple of things like the top goal scorer, clean sheets, assists, player at year and young player at year. Let's get right into it. So, firstly, I'm going to do the table and then I'm going to do the uh, individual awards. Uh, I did it different last year, I did the award before the table. But I'm going to do it a bit differently as well. I'm going to do relegation first. So I'm going to do the top three teams, explain, and so on and so forth. So, for relegation, on this uh, handy piece of paper, I've got Bournemouth in 20th, Fulham in 19th, and Southampton in 18th. Now, I think I'm going to start with Southampton because they're the most interesting one. And I know that a lot of you are going to be thinking, why have you put Southampton there? They've had some good signings. Obviously, they've got James Ward-Prowse. Uh, then I've got Joe Rebo to match him in the midfield. It's the attack. Now, you've got Che Adams up front, but there's not really a good striker partner to him. And I think after Fraser Forster left, I don't think there's a really competent backup. And plus the form last season going into the last five games was kind of poor. So I think that Southampton are going to just get it to the drop just. I think it'll be between like three, four teams for that last spot in the relegation. But 19th Fulham ahead of Bournemouth. I've done this because I feel like Bournemouth have, Bournemouth have just done nothing in the transfer window. Whilst Fulham have got people like Bert Leno in the team now. And... Aaron Hickey, I think it is. If I'm wrong, put it down in the comments. But I think they've got Aaron Hickey, uh, Scottish fullback. Um, but I think Bournemouth will def definitely finish last. I think Fulham will finish 19th, South up to 18th. I'm confident on 20th and 19th, but 18th, I'm not too sure. So uh, next up, I'm going to do 17th to 14th. Now, in this category, it's going to be a bit of a different one. I'm going to name the teams I'm going to go from 14th to 17th down to explain my reasoning as per usual so in 17th I've got Nottingham Forest 16th I've got Brentford in 15th I've got Leeds and in 14th I've got Everton now Everton I think it's kind of obvious they're going to struggle again this season but I don't think it's going to be as bad obviously losing with Charleston is a big hit for the team it's their biggest player it's one of the two players that got him out of relegation last season, along with Jordan Pickford, who is still there, who I think will be vital for the team this season. His uh, shot-stopping ability and his ultimate shithousery will be the key to their survival. Um, Anthony Gordon as well, great young prospect coming through the ranks. And I could see that one working really well. Um, Leeds, similar to Everton, they have lost their two biggest players, Calvin Phillips to Man City and Rafinha to Barcelona and they've obviously got the uh, replacements in Aronson and Tyler Adams it's been a very American centric club nowadays with Jesse Marsh as the manager and I think I think they won't struggle as much because Jesse Marsh has brought in players that he knows and trusts with the American theme similar to another club that I'll be discussing later but I think that overall it's going to be a much a more comfortable season for Leeds and obviously as a hometown Leeds boy I have a bit more confidence with the uh, setup and the style of play of Jesse Marsh and plus last season Leeds were kind of plagued with injuries like they were probably the worst team well they were probably the team that was worst affected by the injuries uh, Patrick Bamford who we know is a clinical goal scorer he might not have the pace to dash past defenders like a Dharma Traore but he has the clinical finishing ability he finished on 17 goals last season which is a really good accomplishment so I think he could replicate numbers like that I think he'll get 14 goals which is pretty good and I think they'll keep leads up uh, next up I put Brentford now, losing Christian Eriksen to Man United on a free is a big hit, but if you haven't seen Sky Sports News earlier today, I think we're filming this on the 3rd of August, 
Brentford have agreed a deal to sign Mikkel Damsgaard and I think that's a great signing. If you don't know who Mikkel Damsgaard is, for England fans, Euro 2021, officially Euro 2020, he scored the free kick against us in Denmark versus England, which tied it to 1-1 and put into extra time. So a bit of history there. He's a really good midfielder. He's really clinical in cleaning up the play and getting that ball forwards. And I think that's going to really help Brentford. And the vision of Mikkel Damsgaard is a good replacement for Ericsson. And I think that could help Brentford survive this season. Finally, Nottingham Forest. Good signing so far. Uh, you got Brendan Johnson up front doing brilliantly last season and doing really good for Wales. Jesse Lingard going to be feeding that ball to him. That's really good. Free transfer for a year. He's earning more than Kai Havertz and Trent Alexander-Arnold. So, and I think that's that's the reason why Jesse went to Nottingham Forest instead of West Ham. If I'm being honest, it's the money. Obviously, they got uh, Dean Henderson on a loan for a year. As a Man United fan, I would have preferred it to have an option to buy, especially after what he said earlier today. So, I don't know. But I think the team is really well set up. Uh, uh, sorry about that. I'm going to cut this out. Anyways, um, with Nottingham overall 17th, I think it's going to be a really good, really solid placement for them. And I think that will be enough for them to adapt, go to next season with the players that they already have, maybe re-sign Jesse Lingard to a multi-year deal instead of one year. Because I felt like that's just compromising them. Because when they get 17th this season, as I predict, Jesse might go to West Ham and it might weaken their attack. And I don't think that's what Nottingham Forest won. So, yeah, 17th for Nottingham. Now we're going to go from 13th to 10th. So we're going to do the bottom half of the table. And then we're going to move to the top half. So, let's get into it. So, 13th to 10th. Now this is where I think the table can really get mixed up. From 14th to 10th. Is where I can see the table really, really getting rejigged about due to signings in the last couple of weeks. I think it's like four weeks left in the window, so anything could really happen. So, 13th to 10th. 13th, I've got Wolves. 12th, I've got Crystal Palace. 11th, I've got Leicester City. Now, I'll explain why in a minute. And 10th, I've got Brighton and Hove Albion. So, let's start with Brighton, shall we? Um, I predict them 10th. I've seen people predict them 13th, 16th, 14th. I think Graham Potter, with the team he has, will have another really good season and will advance the squad again. Will develop the players again. Enoch Wepu is the perfect replacement for Yves Basuma, who's gone to Tottenham. Um, obviously, Cucurella is rumoured to leave. Uh, in the last couple of hours, there's been rumours of him going to Chelsea, which have been denied by Brighton because Fabrizio said, Here we go, and it was false. Tarek Lamptey on the right, who was also transferred from England to Ghana in the nationality. Unfortunately, I was really looking forward to seeing him, Jed Spence, Trent and Rhys James, Carl Walker as the right backs. Gareth Southgate would have had a wet dream over that, so unfortunate. But I think Brighton are going to have another solid season. Um, and I think it's just going to be another case of the ifs and the buts. Like, if they could beat team like Arsenal but they lose to a team like Leicester it's all going to be about that it's all going to be about the consistency in the mid table and I think Brighton out of all those teams besides from Crystal Palace are the most consistent in the bottom half Brighton are technically top half but you know what I mean um, moving on Leicester 11th 
Now, I've put them here for two reasons. I would put them higher, but I think they're going to lose James Madison in this window. And he, in my opinion, is Lasser's best player. And, controversial take, I think this is the season that Brendan Rodgers gets fired from Leicester City. I think that's why they're going to come 11th, and why they're going to drop so low, is because Brendan Rodgers' poor run from October to January. Now you're thinking, there's a World Cup there, but the games before and after the World Cup are going to be so shocking for Brendan Rodgers. He's going to get sacked, they're going to get a new manager in, and they might pick up a bit of momentum. I think they're going to be like 15th when Brendan Rodgers gets sacked. But then they're going to pick up a bit of pace and they're going to climb that table. Also, third thing, Yuri Tillemans. If he goes as well, that's two big hits in the midfield. And I don't think they have to replace those fronts. And having Wilfred Indeed as your star midfielder, yeah, he's been the star midfielder for like two, three years now. But he's had adequate like compatriots alongside him with Tillemans and Madison. But if they both go, as we've seen in the window, Leicester have done no business. It's not going to go out well for them. And I think that's why they're going to be so low in 11th. Now, 12th place, Crystal Palace. Let me tell you about these guys, because I think, whilst they're inexperienced, the talent is there. They may have lost Conor Gallagher, which is a big bonus for Chelsea, trust me. Um... Also, a bit confident because uh, Czech Decore from Lens, young, talented midfielder, it works. And plus, one of the predictions I'm proud of last season was predicting Crystal Palace to be as high as they were. Because people I saw predicting Crystal Palace were thinking they would be in the relegation battle, but I predicted them to be 14th and be comfortable. And I'm proud of that prediction. So I'm going to go with my gut again. Crystal Palace 12th. Uh, you've got Mark Guehi. You've got um, uh, Giata in the goal. You've got a strong front line. You've got Zaha. You've got Lise. You've got Eze. You've got Edouard. I think it's going to be a comfortable season. Now, Wolves. In 2020... We would have put Wolves 8th, 9th. And now I'm putting them 13th because they do not have the adequate amount of players or the quality of players to fight the top 10. Jimenez is an aging striker that they cannot rely on. Uh, Ruben Neves might be leaving, which is going to be their biggest blow, along with James Madison. You're a Tillemans for Leicester. And I think Wolves and Leicester will have a similar trajectory this season. And that's going to be them dropping down into the mid-table. And yeah, that's 10th to 13th. Now I'm going to say P, uh, 9th and 8th. And then I'm going to get on to the Europe places. And let's see where I place some of these elite teams in the Premier League. So, 9th and 8th. This are the teams that will unfortunately just miss out on Europe but I think it's going to be close between 9th, 8th and 7th you'll see why in a minute but 9th and 8th in 9th I've got Aston Villa and in 8th I've got Newcastle United now Newcastle they've done some good business they've brought in Ben Mee and Sven Botman and they might be bringing in James Madison that's 3 solid signings but I don't think it's going to be enough to beat 7th and you'll see why in about a couple of minutes time. But Eddie Howe, last season for me, was manager of the season. Uh, besides Jurgen Klopp. Because he brought a team from 19th all the way down here. And he brought them to 9 points within Manchester United. That's crazy. Like, that is the biggest survival escape I've seen in Premier League history. And the fact that they could do that with people like Dan Byrne, Lascelles and Shaw in their back line 
and now they're gonna have Sved Botman, one of the youngest, one of the best youngest European ball playing centre backs in their line with Kieran Trippier on the right, dashing it up, whipping the balls in, people like Chris Wood, Callum Wilson, Alan St. Maximan. And they're also having James Madison, who I think will join, rushing on the edge of the box, playing those balls in as well. It's going to be a deadly team, Newcastle. And with Eddie Howe as the manager, I have 100% faith they will be in the Champions League in two seasons' time. Not this season, next season. So keep out, keep an eye out for Newcastle this season. Aston Villa. Diego Carlos and Bukar Kamara, two great signings. Newcastle wanted Diego Carlos. Man United were linked with Bukar Kamara, but let's be honest, we're linked with everyone nowadays. Two really, really good signings. Two 8 out of 10s, in my opinion. Diego Carlos, one of the best European centre backs last season, along with Paul Torres, Van Dijk, Diaz, Rudiger. And then Bukar Kamara, one of the best defensive midfielders in France last season, on a cheap, like, it was like 10 mil, I think it was, like 5 10 mil. And it was a bargain, and it's my midfield signer of the summer because of the value of the player they're getting. Simple as that. They're getting a great player, so the amount of money you spend on, I don't know, Harry Maguire, just being honest, <laughs> but you see, you, get what I'm, you see what I'm getting at with Aston Villa's recruitment this season has been quality, unfortunately they are going to lose uh, Chukwameka to Chelsea for 20 million, around that, uh, the deal hasn't been officially confirmed but the, like, the price tag of the deal £20 million pounds is in place. Now, do I think it's going to be a big loss? In about five years, yes. Right now, he's not really a squad player because you've got Jacob Ramsey, John McGann and uh, Morgan Sampson playing those positions in the midfield. And also, Felipe Coutinho. Uh, I think Leon Bailey, Danny Ames will start to get in their stride with the team. Gerard will have another good campaign I think Aston Villa, Newcastle and 7th and even Brighton, those four teams will be separated by 7 points at the end of the season. But they're going to miss out to one team in particular and I'm going to explain why I've put them 7th but I'm also going to say my 6th and 5th place as well. So I'm going to go Conference and Europa League now and you're going to find out where everyone lies right now. 7th, 6th and 5th place. These are the unfortunate souls that are going to have to play in Conference in Europa League and not the almighty Champions League. So in 7th, I've got West Ham United. 6th, I've got Arsenal. And in 5th, I've got Manchester United. Now I'll start off with my United, my club, the best English club of all time. Local fans suck it. Um, so, with Man United this season, it's all about Eric Ten Hag getting his team to work, getting the team to perform, because I think Mark Gobbridge said say it best. You can't polish a turd, and Man United are asking Eric Ten Hag to polish McTominay and Fred into world-class midfielders. Now, if we get De Jong, we're going to have De Jong and Fred in the midfield, I believe. But if we don't, I think it'll be best to have Fred and Van der Beek in midfield, along with Ericsson or Bruno up top uh, in the camp position. I think it should be Ericsson. But that's my opinion at the start of the season. Um, Sancho, as we've seen in pre-season, is going to be a key player for United. Because the two games that he missed out, we drew, and I think we lost. So I think that just shows how clinical he's going to be this season. Rashford is looking like a whole new player almost. Martial is rejuvenated. And I think players like that are going to get a big boost from Eric Ten Hag. Like, 
are finally going to be able to have a step in their stride, like have a hop in their step, like enjoy football. Because I feel like with the Man United players over the last couple of years, they haven't been playing football because they enjoy it, they've been playing it because they have to. Like people like Pogba, Matt, uh, Lingard, Cavani last season, they didn't look like they wanted to play football at Man United, they looked like they wanted to get a paycheck. And now that we've lost about a million on the wage budget, we have room to get people in like Frankie De Jong, who is a world class midfielder, there's no doubt about it. But we spent three months on him and we have got nowhere with his wages. Like Barcelona have shaped their best midfielder in Frankie De Jong and are not paying him jack shit. He's on seventeen million. That's nearly a season of wages. For Frankie De Jong. That's mad. <laughs> like the Barcelona saga, I can discuss in another video, like the financial fair play of it all. But they have they owe Frankie De Jong a season's worth of wages. He's been there for what, three years? He's missed out on a third of his salary. Where is it? Oh, I don't know, it's been in Lewandowski, Rafinha and Kunde. When are the fo when are we going to get involved in this? When are we going to actually push back on Barcelona's and the PSG's making all these mass signings and having nothing to do about it? Like, it's it's nuts. Let's be honest. But I'm gonna, I can rant about that another time. But I think Man United, it depends on how the manager can get the team going and how he can get his new signings with Turo Malassia, Ericsson, um, Lissandro Martinez, who I think could be a, a top class player, let me tell you. Five foot nine is just a number. Honestly, it's just a number on his, on his height. Because when he jumps, he can get up to six foot four, six foot five. Like, he can, he can be as tall as Van Dijk if he jumps. Like, his aerial threat is massive. Him and Maguire in the back line is going to be lethal. And the reason I say Maguire <coughs> is because Lindor ain't quick enough to get back. Neither is Maguire, but Maguire's always been a good aerial threat and he's our captain. And the reason I'm not saying Varane either, he's too injury prone, man. He's too injury prone, and that's just because our our health and welfare of our players is absolutely shocking. And obviously I could rant about Man United's problems in another video, so I'm going to get straight on to Arsenal. Great signing in Gabriel Jesus and Zinchenko. I think Arteta has finally got his main striker, and Zinchenko is about as versatile as anything you can get really like he can play left back CDM he, he can rush up and play like a left mid as well if Martinelli and Smith Rowe are out but I think with Zinchenko his main position in his career has been left back but we've already got Kieran Tierney but I think Zinchenko will start left back because Kieran Tierney is about as injury prone as Phil Jones so, with that, I think that the reason United are going to top Arsenal is the manager. You cannot tell me Arteta is on the level of Eric Ten Hag. Two completely different managers on completely different levels. And Ten Hag is just a level above Arteta. And I think he'll do much better with that United squad than Arteta will do with that Arsenal squad. West Ham in the Conference League. Let's talk about it. A couple of days ago, I think it was actually um, August 1st, West Ham got Skamaka. They finally got a striker. And that is why I put them above Newcastle and Aston Villa. They've got a great striker now. They've got Agard, I think it is. Never mind. And they've finally got Ariola on a permanent from PSG. That's just great business overall. And with Declan Rice, Ben Rama, Jared Bowen, Pablo Fanals, 
Thomas Socek, fucking Kurt Zuma. Like, that is a good team, and they will face seventh because they've got the capabilities to know. And no offense to Mikel Antonio, he's Mr. Big Dick himself, but Skamaka is now the world class striker they have been looking for. And that is why they'll finish seventh place. So, we've got fourth, third, second, and first. Now, we all know who the teams are. We all know they're going to be playing Champions League. But my question to you is can you guess what all of you will come in? But I guarantee you, you probably can't. <laughs> so, let's do fourth, third, and then we'll do second and first. Okay? So, fourth and third place, this is where it's going to get kind of close. Because depending on the business that this team does, it's going to be a very flip-floppy season. Chelsea in fourth, who I think are going to be battling United and Arsenal, kind of. I think the gap between Chelsea and United will be like eight points. But until like February, I think it's going to be kind of like three, four points. And then United will kind of open themselves up to what they had last season with poor form. So I think Chelsea are going to kind of be on their own unless the business that I've been hearing about comes true. Because so far, they've got Telugu Kula Bali, Raheem Sterling, they've got Conor Gallagher back, which is basically who's signing, and is a completely revolutionary player for Chelsea. They've longed out Romelu Lukaku to Inter. Fair enough. Now they need a proper striker. If that was them, I would have recommended Skamaka, but he kind of got to West Ham, the opposite side of London. So they're kind of a bit benched on that area unless they go for Ronaldo at United, which is another, another topic itself. But I think Chelsea, fourth place with Todd Bowley's first season, season of him being an owner, is a good start. So, I don't think they could play Tottenham. I think they've had the best transfer window out of any club in England this season, period. Basuma, Perisic, they've got Romero, I think, on a permanent. They've got Richarlison, they've got Jed Spence. These players are Conte players, and Conte is going to wring them dry and make them commit 100% to every game. It doesn't matter if it's Blackburn in the FA Cup or Man City in the Premier League. He's going to make them work their asses off. And that's just what Antonio Conte is. And that's why he's one of my favourite managers in the world over the last decade. Because he's willing to put players through shit so deep that when they come up against like some Man City and Liverpool, Madrid... It doesn't phase them who the players are, as long as they play their football as their mentor, they're going to win. Look at Chelsea in 2017. They won the league with them, five at the back. Victor Moses became one of the best right wing backs in the world. Because that's what Conte does. Imagine this for a moment. Jeff Spence and Kulisevsky on the right. You've got Hyun Min Son, who was the best player of the Prem last season and Perisic on the left you've got Kane up front who could be changed out with Richarlison you've got Benton Kerr and Basuma oh you've also got Langley in the back with Romero and Davies with a recent goal maybe Fraser Forster as well like that is mad they now have the depth of Man City and Liverpool. Obviously City's depth is out of this world. Like City is just something else. But they now have a similar squad depth to Liverpool in the quality of it. Like Imagine being able to change out Harry Kane, Hyung Min Song and Kulosevsky for Perisic, Richarlison. And I don't even know. Like it's, it's crazy. And the fact that Conte is a manager and he's actually got Tottenham to back him. That's the first time we see Tottenham fully back a manager since Pochettino. 
in like 2017. They literally sold off 150 million of their shares to get transfers in. And they're all Conte signings. So you know what that means? Conte is going to be a dominant force with Tottenham this season. And they are going to be close to Liverpool and Man City until February. I think by then, it's going to kind of, the fatigue is going to wear down on them. And the fact that Liverpool and City are just two different monsters of their own. Like, Tottenham may have the depth, but they don't have the quality, if that's what I mean. Like, I know I said earlier they have the quality and depth, but it's not Liverpool and City quality. Like, Liverpool have so many world-class players on the bench, so do Man City, which is mad. I mean, there's just salt on, like, about a month ago. Gabby Jesus, Raheem Sterling, Zinchenko. Quality on the bench that they could have utilised. Obviously, they got rid of them because of one man. But we'll get into that down here or there. But Tottenham third, I think, is a pretty solid bet. Unless Chelsea come out with madness and Thomas Tuchel just waves by Tottenham with the middle finger throughout the season. And I don't know what's going to happen. But... Second and first place. This is probably the hardest one. Second and first. Because it's unpredictable. Both teams could win the league. Both teams could have a shit season. But... I'm going to put Liverpool second and Man City first. Now, obviously there's some Liverpool fans out there who think Nunes is on the level of Haaland and please. Um, Haaland as a signing for Man City. That front line, oh my god. You have Kevin De Bruyne, Erling Haaland, Phil Foden, and Riyad Mahrez coming at your defence. I think Liverpool could deal with that, you know, with Van Dijk, Canate, Trent and Robbo. But it's gonna be much more difficult. But as the British Shield showed, Van Dijk could deal with Haaland on a regular day but the more Haaland gets used to that City team the more he gets used to that tactic the more of a monster he's going to become and that is just scary to me that someone of Haaland's quality someone who's on the levels of Kylian Mbappe who's considered one of the best players in the world at Manchester City with Kevin De Bruyne and the best playmaker in the world Foden, the best youngster in the world, and Mares, one of the most technically gifted Africans in the world, behind Salah and Mane, obviously. But we'll get to that in a minute. But City's team is what you dreamt your team to be like, like 10 years ago. Like, you dreamt of a team like this, but City's owners have made that reality. This team is the most expensive team in history in terms of the transfer budget of them. It's around 600 700 million pounds, that entire squad of City. It's just mad. And Liverpool, listen. I think you've kind of taken a little bit of a back step because you've lost one of the best left wingers in the world in Sadio Mane and I don't think Nunes can fill those shoes right now and you expect him to it's too high pressure on him you can't expect him to go into the Premier League smashing 20 plus goals alongside Salah Son, Kane Haaland Ronaldo maybe like you can't expect that from him you need to let him ease into the squad you can't just like Oi, Nunes, transfer at season, yeah? 20 plus goals, 10 plus assists. He's going to smash City's back doors in. He's going to win us the league. No. <laughs> no, no, no. Stop all that. You need to let him evolve with the team. You need to let him have his time with the team before you can say he's world class. Because you don't really know yet. Yeah, he scored a couple of goals in pre season. But it's just pre season. Like, as I've said. Yeah, we beat Liverpool 4 0, but it's just pre season. Like, Liverpool didn't have that great of a squad, but at the same time, we have been testing stuff out with our players. And we just. I don't know. It's. 
I feel like Liverpool just have too high, high expectations of their transfers nowadays because they've seen what they've done to people like Robertson and Salah. I don't think Klopp's going to do that immediately with Nunes. Give him a season or two to become world class. Don't expect it immediately. Like, I get it. You've got Luis Diaz on the left. It doesn't matter if you got rid of Mane. You've got Luis Diaz. The club would be a beast. But you need to be more realistic with your goals of your new players. Like, Nunes is not going to set the lead alight as you expect it to. While someone like Salah will, and he has done for the last five years. Like, I could see Nunes becoming one of the top five strikers in the world, or in the Prem, for that matter. But you need to give him time. You can't expect him to just pull it out of his arse in the third season and be like, here you go, local fans. Like, he's not going to do that. You need to give him time to develop and evolve with the team. And you just need to be more realistic. That's that's what I'm going to say about local. I think you're just aiming too high. And I think that's just pretty much what I can say about local. You're just aiming too high. You're going to touch the sun. And it's all going to come burning down for you in your expectations of Nunes. I think Nunes will score 14 goals. I don't think he's going to be top five in the golden boot race. But I think he'll be a consistent player for Klopp. But I don't think he's going to be what you Liverpool fans are expecting of him. Salah, I'll talk about him in a minute. But in terms of the players that you already have, they're world class. Like, you've got Alisson in goal, who's tied for clean sheets with Edison last season on 20. I don't know how Brazil are going to decide between those two. Uh, you've got Van Dijk, who whilst he's adapting a new defending style, he's coming a bit more like witted on his tackles whilst before he got injured he was just sliding in left right and centre he's still one of the best in the world whilst developing this new style of defending for himself Joel Matip underrated defender um, obviously there's some local fans who think he should be like dropped for Kanate but I think if you just rotate the three that you've got right now it's going to be a healthy for the three players they're going to get adequate amount of game time they're going to be very consistent and it's going to be great um, Robertson Trent best fullback partnership in the Prem um, you've got Henderson Fabinho Thiago Keita um, Harvey Elliott who I think is going to set the world alight this season He's gonna he's gonna come back better than ever. I think he will replace Henson in the team as well, so it's gonna be Thiago, Fabinho and Harvey Elliott. That is gonna be deadly. And Thiago last season, in the second half of the season, was great. And if he can carry on that form, Liverpool are gonna be deadly. But I don't think Liverpool are gonna dominate the world like they're expected to. I think you've got to be similar to last season, you've got to be good in the domestic cups. Champions League, you might get into the final again. You might lose it again. But it's a really good chance you could win more than one trophy. But I don't think you'll get as close as last season you did. You're not going to be chanting about the quadruple in there. Whilst that's an amazing achievement that you that you had a possible chance at that, it's not going to happen. I think you'll win the FA Cup. Again, Carabao Cup will go to City. Champions League is tough. Because you've got Bayern with Mane, Gravenberg, Masraoui. You've got PSG. You've got Real Madrid, who won it last season. You've got Barcelona, who are looking good now with their new signings, if they can register them. But, yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to stick with that. Um, now, for the individual awards, top scorer. It's tough, but I'm going to go Mo Salah. I don't think Haaland's going to win it. I think Haaland, the one with Nunes, they'll do well for their team, but they won't set the league alight straight away. I think Salah will get 27 goals next season. And I think Son will get 25. Haaland will get 21. Those will be the top three, I think. But Salah will win the goal of boot. The assist king, Kevin De Bruyne, the best playmaker in the world, as I've said. He will get about 12 assists next season. 
he's going to be on a different level. Obviously, from the start of the season to about November, he was a bit off. But after that, he came back better. He was old Kevin De Bruyne. He was the best midfielder in the world from December onwards. Uh, clean sheets. It's been tough to think about it, but I'm going to go Edison. I think him and Allison will scrap for it again, but I think Edison will only win by one clean sheet. Um, now, player of the year. It's going to be interesting, but bear with. I've gone to Jung Min Son, because I think Son will get second in the goal scoring charts and second in the assists. I think he will have a great season again, and he'll prove why he's the best Asian player to have a grace to Premier League. And finally, the last award, Young Player of the Year. And contemplating over some of the players that it could have been. Kaio Saka, Emil Smith Rowe were up there. Um, but I would have got Phil Foden. Like, that, that kid is something else. I rate him so highly that it's unreal what he can do at his age. Like, him and Jude Bellingham are two English players and what they could put up in terms of their performances crazy I'm jealous that he's a Man City player I'm going to be honest like I would love to have him in our Man United midfield or attack uh, but yeah he's my own player at the year I don't know how old Harvey Elliott is I might have to fact check after the video but if he was under 23, I think it is the limit. No, it's under 22. Um, if he's under 22, he's my second place honourable mention. As I said, I think he's going to set the league alight this year. I think he's going to be a great asset to Liverpool midfield. Him and Thiago are going to work like toast and butter, in my opinion. But with that being said, ladies and gentlemen... Those are my Premier League predictions, as you cannot see. <laughs> but uh, I'd just like to thank you all for watching. Uh, I'll be back uh, soon with some more videos, kind of like this. And yeah, finally take this stupid tie off. But yeah, um, I'd like to thank you all for watching. From your uh, my GM champ currently, from Austinator's Universe mode, well, G GM mode. If you haven't watched it, I'll put a link down in the description below. But, as your current champ, I'd like to say uh, God bless you all. And I hope you all have a good weekend. And I hope you all enjoy, finally, some Premier League football. I'm so glad it's Batman.